It's an indelible image from an unforgettable time. John Dickerson takes us on a journey to the past. May God's grace be with you in all the days ahead. And so Richard Milhouse Nixon has resigned as the 37th president of the United States. It was Nixon's decision to leave office, but he had little choice. There was near total agreement in both parties that he had committed some or all of what he was accused of, abuse of power, obstruction of justice, and contempt of Congress. Fifty years later, would the same thing happen in today's political climate? I really find it hard to believe that Nixon would have resigned in an environment like the one we have today. As a lecturer about conservative politics at the University of Pennsylvania, Brian Rosenwald has thought about the what-ifs of the Watergate scandal. He would have dug in. He would have had enough support to avoid conviction. Up until the very end, Richard Nixon was dug in. That's just plain poppycock. The day before he relented, the front page of the Washington Post read, Nixon says he won't resign. But unlike what we might expect today, Nixon's party had abandoned him. Whatever decision he makes, it will be in the best interest of our country. Senator Barry Goldwater had been the last Republican presidential nominee before Nixon. And on August 7, 1974, he and Republican leaders in Congress visited the White House. There had been no decision made. We were merely there to offer what we see as a condition on both floors. The condition was dire. Impeachment is really a foregone conclusion. The majority of Republicans were likely to vote to impeach Nixon in the House, and there weren't enough Republican senators to block his conviction in the Senate. A day after the meeting, Nixon's decision led to the iconic Washington Post headline. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. In the 50 years since that announcement, that White House visit by leaders of the president's own party telling him his time was over may tell us less about what was happening then than it tells us about what is happening in our politics now. In our modern era where we're so cynical about our politics, it's almost impossible to capture how different the political landscape was, you know, 72, 73, 74. Garrett Graff is the author of Watergate, A New History. Even Democrats trust Nixon because they say, you know, the president would never lie to the American people. We can't impeach the president. He's the president. You know, if he is saying he's not involved in Watergate, he's telling us the truth. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate break-in. No prior knowledge, perhaps, but Nixon had been involved in the cover-up after the burglary and wiretapping of the Democratic National Committee headquarters, abusing his power to obstruct the investigation and defying congressional subpoenas for evidence. Proof came from one of the bombshell moments in the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, the Watergate hearings. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. On one of the tapes, direct evidence against the president. What comes out is the smoking pistol tape. In it is a recording from the first day that Richard Nixon is back in the White House after the Watergate break-in. And it effectively shows that Nixon was part of the cover-up from the earliest hours. The process worked. The constitutional process worked. Watergate is a story of incredible corruption and criminality. But to me, it's actually an incredibly inspirational story of how our system works and the incredible ballet of checks and balances written into our Constitution. Every institution in Washington had to come together to play a special and important and unique role. What was the basic shared norm that they believed in? Everyone agreed at that moment, Richard Nixon was not above the law. That agreement could be reached because politicians weren't attached to their parties the way they are today. What did the president know, and when did he know it? Howard Baker of Tennessee, the top Republican on the Watergate committee, probed for the truth. He didn't erect obstacles to protect his party's president. 
our electoral politics have changed in the, the last half century. We've become much more geographically polarized, which means red states and blue states. And the way that that manifests today is the most important election for most people are primaries because that's the place they can lose. And who shows up for primaries? It is the people consuming ideological media. They're engaged and they're usually far right or far left. This was the biggest day of the Watergate hearings yet. Lawmakers answered to an electorate where voters consumed the same information. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. 85% of households watched some portion of the Watergate hearings. And didn't you bug his telephone conversation with you? No, sir. Didn't you record it? Then? Yes, sir. Did you tell him in advance? To <laughs> Nixon didn't think that he was committing crimes. Well, he thought he was the law and order president. Nixon may have believed it, but there was no pro-Nixon media apparatus to feed that alternative reality to the public during the 784 days between break-in and resignation. One can only be angry with those he respects. I don't think we could see a moment like that happen because of the media environment, the poisoned information ecosystem that politics now exists in is all but inescapable. If Richard Nixon had Fox News in 1974, he would have survived. Rosenwald imagines how the political and media developments of our world today would have played out 50 years ago. Given what you know about the conservative world, is it possible to imagine what the response of today's pro-president party would be to the smoking gun? They would say, they're just getting rid of our guys. They're getting rid of our champions. They would have pointed at all kinds of malfeasance from Democrats and said, oh, look at those guys still serving. Nobody ran them out of office. And they would have pointed at the media and said, they did nothing about it. They are out to get you. They hate you, and then basically said, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of your enemy, or are you on the side of your guys? Nixon might not be perfect, but all of a sudden, he's our guy. He's our guy may capture best the modern instances where lawmakers put party above all else. Though that instinct did not prevail when Democratic leaders convinced Joe Biden to abandon his campaign. Pass the torch to a new generation. It did rule with Donald Trump when the moral stakes were at Watergate levels. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. Let's go! After the January 6th attack on the Capitol, Republican leaders accused the president of their party of breaking his oath. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy spoke to his colleague Liz Cheney about an impeachment resolution. And the only discussion I would have with him is that I think this will pass, and it would be my recommendation we should be done. In the end, there was no White House visit. McCarthy has now endorsed Trump, as McConnell has. Fifty years after Watergate, the question is not whether a tough love visit by members of a president's party is possible. It is. What's changed is what motivates the lawmakers willing to take the walk.